Pastor Steve's been doing a uh, message the past two weeks on prayer, having a great prayer life and what it does to you and fasting, getting our soul and our flesh um, under the authority of our spirit so that we live a spirit-led life. It's been so good. So I thought I would just tag on the end of that and just kind of speak to that a little bit. Is that okay? So I want to be closer to God. How about you? doesn't matter how long you've been a believer, I promise you, I've been doing this 40 odd years now, 40 odd years, well, it's four decades, four lots of 10, ooh, that's just a whole lot right there. It's shocking because you don't realize how quickly life goes, but I want to be closer to God. God, I just want to know you more. And don't you feel like, for those of us who have been Christians and on this journey for a while, the more you know, the more you don't know? Isn't that true? It's like, wow. Wow. And so I just thought I would look at the life of Jesus and some things that he taught us about being closer to God, having a closer walk with God. The first thing he taught us was how to pray. Because praying can feel hard, and especially if you come to a prayer meeting and there may be an expectation of praying out loud, it can feel awkward, and what do I say? And what if I say the wrong thing? Have you ever, anyone ever thought that? I don't want to pray out loud because I don't know if I'm going to pray the right thing. And I just want to say to you, I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt so many times. I prayed in front of you guys and said things and got off the platform and thought, what was that? So I promise you, we don't get it. It's not like God's up there going, okay, she did this, and she said this, and she asked for that, and she thanked me for that. Great, great prayer. It's not. He so desires relationship with you. He's like, just come. Can you come? Just sit. Just take a moment. And talk to me. You know, I remember years ago, I was, um, I'd become a Christian. I'd been on this journey for about two years, and we would go to our Friday night prayer meeting before church, and I'd be thinking, and everybody would pray out loud, and I thought, God, I want to be a leader. I feel called to be a leader, so I should be able to pray out loud. And every week, I'd walk into that prayer meeting, and doggone it, if everybody else was just jumping in, I'd walk out, you know, they'd walk out pumped, and I'd be like, oh, I can't even pray out loud. I'm a failure as a Christian. But you know, that's not true. Absolutely not true. Because one week I went, and miraculously, there was a pause. You know, it seemed like everybody wanted to pray. There was this little pause, and I'd had my one sentence rehearsed for so long, I jumped right in. Boom. Did it. I don't know what I prayed. I don't even know if it made sense. But you know what? I was in it heart and soul. And out of that, God, who was very gracious and kind to me, took me on this journey of getting to know him better. So the Jewish people or the disciples had been doing life with Jesus. You know, the 12 that he picked, he goes, guys, I want you to do life with me. And they were raised in a church environment where very much of it was tradition. Their prayers were something that they learned and memorized. That was their prayer. And and then they did life with Jesus. And do you know they, they watched him? And there was something about the way he, like when he prayed, he, he like connected with God. I mean, his prayers were not just something that they'd learned. He really prayed. And they were like, Jesus, can you teach us to pray? And this is what Jesus says to them in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. This then, Jesus said, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. In other words, connect with God relationally. This isn't a formal prayer. This isn't rhetoric. This is something that you know. How many of you have been in some kind of environment where they say, okay, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, yeah? And so you just were accustomed to going through the motion of saying that, oh, okay, that's a prayer. But actually what Jesus was doing was he was kind of giving us an outline. He wasn't saying, hey, verbatim, do this. He's like, this will set you up to pray and connect with God. Our Father in heaven, he is a relationship with, he's a relational God and he wants relationship with you. And he wants you to get to know him. He was saying he's your father and he's available at any moment, any moment, any time. To spend time with you makes him smile. You know, for those of us who have children and as they get bigger, and teenagers and young adults, they're busy. Their life's coming and going. 
And it's easy for them to text you something or come in and race out. But when they sit down and say, hey, mom, can, can I chat with you? Oh, isn't that right? It's like, wow. Do you know, God's the same. We, we're busy with our life. We come in and out. We're like, hey, God, what? Just sit. Let's, let's talk. Let's enter into and enjoy this relationship. Second thing you see, he says, Jesus says is, hallowed be thy name. Let me tell you about my father. He's a holy God. Holy God. But he desires relationship with humanity more than anything in the world. When you cry, he cries. When you hurt, he hurts. When you're grieving, he's grieving right there beside you. But he said, let me tell you about him. This God in heaven, he's your protector. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The word, the word says he's your healer. If you're facing illness, you can go to him knowing. You're my healer, Lord Jesus. He's my provider. Everything I have is yours, Lord Jesus, and I thank you for that. I'd like to think I'm smart enough to make it on my own, but I know I'm not. I am grateful to you, God. He is a good, good father. And he's a prince of peace. God, thank you. As I come to spend time with you this morning, I just love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That you are my provider. That you are my protector. The word says that I honor you as a holy God who knows everything about me and still loves me with a passion. Third thing is, Jesus says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know how many times I have found myself dumping on God. Oh, I need to pray. God, I can't believe this is happening. You need to help me with it. I forgot the relationship part. I, and I think as believers, especially in the 21st century, we think God is there just to do for us. Oh, he wants to do for us. But he wants way more than that. He wants our life, our heart. He wants us to spend time in his presence. He wants us to get to know him because when we get to know him, we won't come, we won't come to him, me, 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 my, 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 or I'm so angry, God, you could do this because you would know that your father loves you so much and that what you're going through, he knows about and there's answers for you. I don't know how many prayers Steve and I have prayed for my family. And you know, I would have said to you 40 years ago, they'll never get saved. They'll never be in church. But I've watched over four decades. I've watched miracles happening in their lives. I've watched their hearts soften towards the things of God when they were angry at church and didn't agree with it and believe it. I've watched, you know, our youngest son got married about four years ago and um, his wife, her dad is a pastor and her granddad is a pastor, and her granddad is, he has a big church in Houston, Texas. He is an influential church leader. And you know, at their wedding, I just smiled because when they did all the seating, here's my dad sitting next to Laurie's granddad. And they were cutting up and having fun and talking about golf, and my dad was asking him questions about church. You know, my family live on the other side of the world, Australia. So here we are, four decades after I've prayed, God, move in their life, I open their heart, I want them to know you. And I smiled as I saw my dad sitting next to this great influential church leader. I promise you, if I'd have tried to set it up, I couldn't have, but God. So the people that you pray for and the ones that you think they'll never, I promise you, God wants them to be saved more than you. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. Don't just go to God when you need something. Go every day. God, thank you that today, whatever I need, I know what you've already provided it. I know you have. When Steve and I were first married, we were, oh, actually we'd married a couple of years, pregnant with our first baby, and we were looking for a house. We had to be out of our apartment. We wanted to buy a house. But we only had X amount of budget. And 
You know, people were saying, you're not going to find anything, but I was determined. I'm telling you, when you're on a mission, when you're a woman on a mission or a man on a mission, when you've got something in your heart, when you trust God at his word, God, I know what they say, but I trust you're my provider, so I just believe you're going to give us a house. And so we found this little house, and it was for the price and the good news is it wasn't about to fall over because, you know, if I just said to people, oh, we bought a house for this, they'd have been like, okay, really? What does that look like, you know? But it was great. And I remember when we went to the mortgage company and the woman doing our mortgage document said, but there are no houses in this area for that amount of money. There aren't any. I said, yeah, but God, yeah. he is your provider, friend. He is your provider. Then he goes on, Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And boy, this is a big one. In a culture that screams offense and anger and my rights and this, God help me keep my heart free of bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. Now you're gonna say that this week? You're gonna say that, yeah. I promise you this week something's gonna happen that's gonna really turn your life upside down and you're gonna get, and you're going to want to get bitter, angry, and not forgive. You're going to be challenged to do that. And that's why we need Jesus every day. Help me, help me to keep my heart as pure as I can. And Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I know there's an enemy that wants to destroy my life and wants to destroy your life too. So I need to pray every day as I go into my world and my life and the same with yours. God, help me make the right decisions and the right choices. This week, I may be, I don't know, find myself in an arena where I feel like my back is against the wall. I feel like I'm, I'm going to have to compromise to get out of it. I feel like, God, and I'm saying to us, pray. God, don't let me make that choice. God, give me the courage and the ability to stand up and go, no, I, I can't do that. I'm sorry. No matter what flat comes at me, Lord, I need you to help me, and I promise you, he will. Our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The second thing in watching the life of Jesus and how he taught us to be closer to God was he taught us the importance of a community of believers. So important. Jesus originally gathered 70 disciples that he sent out in twos. 35 lots of two went out to preach the word, to get the area ready before he came. But he also had 12 And then out of that 12, he had three. Your community group, listen, you know we talk about community groups a lot. And, you know, some of you will be like, I don't want to, I just haven't found a community. Listen, get yourself in a community group. Get believers around you. Believers that are going to pray with you, encourage you. They're going to challenge you, I promise you. When I was uh, uh, just... Steve and I were dating. I remember my community group challenged me. Do you know what you're thinking dating this guy who's barely saved? I remember thinking, and I said to them, I don't, but I trust you guys. My life is open to you and by the grace of God, but I'm thankful for those people who were around me, encouraged me and challenged me and made me really think about where my life was headed. I love that. And that's what can happen for you too. They're gonna, you're gonna have friends, and this was the thing, you know, Jesus had 12, but then he had three, and they bitterly disappointed him at times. Bitterly. But he saw their heart. And he knew that ultimately, they deeply loved him. They didn't get it right all the time. And for us as Christians, isn't it true? You have a friend and they don't respond to you the right way. They let you down. They do something that shocks you, whatever. And you're like, right, that's it, no more a friend. And I'm just saying to us as believers, we've got to be better at being letting offense go and really being deeply committed to the people that God has. I I just know, God. see, God has planted Steve and I right here with you guys. That's what he, so I can fight it and wrestle with it and go, or I can go, you know what? Thank you, Jesus. I'm so, not, and not, I'm telling, fighting it in the sense of we're always looking for over here, over there. But God says, listen, it's right where you are. Right where you are, you're going to see miracles happen. The people that know you the best and love you the most are going to walk you and believe with you and encourage your faith. Yeah. 
give you wisdom and insight to pursue and do all that God's called you to do. Sadly, we think it's over there and out there and behind there. I promise you, the daily happened in Jesus' life with the men that he surrounded himself with, and he showed them, you're not gonna be able to do this alone, guys. You're gonna need each other. Third thing Jesus taught us was that people matter. Always interruptible, always had time for people. If you wanna be close to God, have time for people. Have time for people. I've been reminded, even just recently, how everyone has a story, every single person. And then often we can judge a person with one conversation. Just recently, Steve and I went to a dude ranch and there was a woman there who's been single a lot of her life. She got uh, married and her husband died when they were like early 30s and they, ne- I, and I, so I said to her, she was telling me a story, it's probably close to 70. I said, so did you have any children? He said, oh no. No, I told Tim, you marry me, we're not having children. Don't think about changing my mind, mm, not gonna happen. So I have that initial conversation, I'm like, whoa, you know. But see, the beauty of this was that I was in a dude ranch for five days and I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with 30 people, so I got to know them a little better. So as we conversed a little bit more, I found out that when she was a little girl, her mum abandoned the family, her older sister did too, and she was left with a dad who was trying to make ends meet and figure out how to make life work with six other children, and she was the oldest and she had to bring them up. Oh, wow. Thank you for allowing me to be in your shoes for a moment. Let me take my judgmental Christian whatever. You know what I'm saying, guys? Is that sometimes we jump to a conclusion when we've really not even got to know the person. Um, Again, just recently, I was telling the nine o'clock service that um, I was confronted with caring for people and looking out for people when I was taking one of my grandkids for a walk, you know, in the little wagons, you pull them along, and on the way back, there's a beautiful old lady, one of our neighbors, who's 100 yards from my house, literally. And I stopped to talk to her. I haven't really talked to her. Sadly, I've lived there 17 years, maybe one time, honestly. Anyway, she, um, I was saying, oh, you know, it's good to see you. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've seen you and your husband out raking the leaves. And, you know, it's, and she says to me, she looks at me and she says, Well, my husband died seven years ago. And honest to God, I felt like I got hit in the stomach. You live 100 yards from me. Now I can tell you all the reasons why I didn't know. Like just the way the house faces, there's bushes that hide. I mean, I can tell you all the reasons why, but I should have. This is what Luke 10 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I felt so convicted. I went back over there with some cupcakes. I said to her, you know what, I just want to apologize because this is what I said, I have not been a good neighbor. And she said, but you're busy. You're the preacher's wife, right? I'm like, yep, failure, (laughs) failure, (laughs) failure. And you've got three kids. Yeah. In fact, she knew more about my life than I knew about hers. I said, well, I just want to apologize to you. She said, yeah, I live here by myself and um, I don't want to go into a nursing home. I said, well, I want you to know that Steve and I will be checking on you and making sure you're doing okay. Boy, I was deeply convicted that day. And then there's Jared, my son-in-law and our daughter who live in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood They are practicing Jews or religious Jews, so they observe the Sabbath, sundown, Friday night to sundown Saturday. And Jared had been trying to connect with some of the neighbors. In fact, he'd been mowing some of the front lawns, and he's like, man, I don't even get a, it's like they just walk by, they don't care, it's like, oh, hey, they just walk by. You ever feel snubbed by people? And so this year, Jared went to Israel, and he was asking some, the religious Jews there, who actually they were Messianic Jews, so they were Jews that had been saved, accepted Christ, beautiful. He said, how do I connect with my neighbor? 
Like, I, I just don't know what to do. And so this gentleman said to him, okay, when it's on the Sabbath, uh, just when, when you walk by, just say Shabbat Shalom. That means peace to you on the Sabbath. So sure enough, Jared out in his neighborhood, and he walks by and he says, Shabbat Shalom. And they instantly turn around. Shabbat Shalom. And in fact, he had Jax, his, our little grandson with him, and all the kids were like, hey, Jax. They all knew his name, but they'd never played with him or talked to him. But guess what? Jared entered their world. And you could say, well, that's not right. They should be. <laughs> Jesus said, love me, love me neither. Yeah. Simple, simple, but not easy all the time, right? And so now they're celebrating this week. I think it's the Festival of Tabernacles and all the families sit outside. They make this kind of makeshift wooden thing and there's no roof and they sit and they sing. In fact, Alyssa sent me video uh, of them singing and they said to Jack, come over, come over and see what we do. Wow, they've been invited into that, their world. What a privilege. Love me, Jesus. Jesus, God, Jesus said, the Bible says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor. I think somewhere we made loving our neighbor a little complicated along the way. Fourth thing Jesus taught us was about solitude. I think solitude is a dying art in the 21st century but it's having space for our soul to be refreshed. Mark 1.35 says this. Mark is talking, and he says very early, he's talking about Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. By himself. He did the... He, he often did that, and he did it for these different reasons, for preparation, preparing for his life, for his ministry. A day of hard work, he would retreat, solitude. Big decisions, solitude. <laughs> when his cousin John the Baptist died, solitude. Stressed, solitude. Solitude is a dying art in the 21st century. I'm telling you, we have so much noise in our life, chaos. The TV screaming at us because all the stuff that's going on in the world, our devices that we hold nonstop, I'm so guilty. We need to find space for our soul to be refreshed. Recently, I stumbled across a photographer that took pictures of people with their devices and then he removed the devices and so he shot the pictures of, and, and it's how we look in the 21st century, how we look interacting with each other. And honestly, when I looked at these pictures, a number of them I saw myself in and thought I'm being suck suctioned into a void of disconnection quicker than I even believe. And you know, I know there's technology and I know digital stuff is good and necessary, but there's one thing that Listen, our, our human heart hasn't, hasn't evolved. We need connection. We need relationship. That's why church is so important. Not just online, like, I'm tell, not just online. Like, online is great, and thank God for it. But we need to rub shoulders with each other. We need to look people in the eye and say, how are you really? When they're crying, we need to put our arm around them. When they've achieved something, we cheer them on. I promise you, it doesn't matter what echelon of life you find yourself in. People who are very successful, they all have a need of God and people. They do. And so I'm going to get the guys just to go through the, there we are, sitting at the dining table, just hanging out. Next one, guys. There we are, just a couple, you know. This is our world right now. Next uh, picture. A couple guys hanging around the grill. Next picture. Yep, just got married, yep. Next picture. Little boys, little kids. Next picture. Mum and a daughter. And then the last picture. Which scared me particularly because how, how guilty am I of going to bed and people say, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'll just check it. Disconnection. I'm telling you, it's taking me away from the very people that God has put me in relationship with. I pray that we would make peace, uh, room for solitude. We just went to a dude ranch, I was telling you about that, Steve and I. 
And, uh, you know, we were with 30 people for five days. It kind of sounds like a youth camp kind of a thing because you eat breakfast and lunch and dinner with them. But it was, it was just, and youth camps are awesome, by the way. But um, here we were with people that we didn't know and didn't know us. We got shown to our cabin. They're like, ah, there's no Wi-Fi service here. And there's no television. We're like, we're looking at each other like, what are we going to do? But can I tell you, when I came back from that week, I felt more refreshed. I felt happier. I felt more connected to God than I had in a very long time. Space for our soul. I'm telling you, parents, take those devices off your kids at times. I know you've got to send them to school. With fun. I get it. But listen, I watch my grandkids with a device, and it sucks. It's like their whole world. Boom. And I'm like, believers, stand up and go, yep, there's a place for them, but they're not going to take over our life. We've got to create space for the Lord Jesus in our families, in our homes. Teach our kids how to pray. Take them through the Lord's Prayer. Explain to them the importance of community, that youth is so vital. Help them to love their neighbor at school and have peace at home. When they come in, you're sitting at the dinner table, get the TV off, get the devices away. I promise you, even if the device is there, they're thinking about it. Because I want to know him. I want to be closer. I want to live the life that he's called me to live, and I don't get it right every day and every time. But I'm certainly on the journey. And I want to know him more. How about you? 